Hi everyone. Happy spring. It's fun here in Bethesda and I'm very happy uh, about that. Nice sunny day today. Um, first I want to thank Jody Eckerd from Alternative Communication Services for providing CART this evening. Thank you very much, Jody. And very happy to have Dr. Kathleen Sinkowski uh, with us tonight. Before we get started, I would like just to uh, point out to you um, on the left hand side of your screen, you should see a row of uh, four icons. There's a little smiley face, there's a hand, and there on the far right of that line there is a lowercase a. And it has, if you put your mouse over that, you'll see A, B, and C. That is where you will be able to select your answer to the questions, two questions that uh, Dr. Sinkowski has for you in her presentation. So I just want to point that out. If you click on one of those letters, it will register um, and let us know what your answer is. Okay, um, so with that in mind, and everybody should have captions now, um, the CC button at the top of the video screen or click Control F8 on your keyboard. Um, again, welcome Dr. Sinkowski, I'm very happy to have you. Um, Dr. Sinkowski is an Associate Professor and Program Director of Audiology at the University of Connecticut. She studies the development of programs that will improve the use of amplification and explores psychological and social issues underlying acceptance of amplification with an emphasis on older adults with hearing loss. Very happy to have you again and I'll let you get started with your slides. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy, and um, thank you to HLAA for inviting me to give this webinar. Um, it's exciting. Um, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and so I'm happy to um, share what I know or what I think about this topic uh, with the group. I'm going to do my best to master this technology, but if at any point I do something wrong, please somebody, uh, I guess, send a message to Nancy, um, and we'll get it fixed as we go along. Uh, just to let you know um, what we are going to cover in today's webinar, I'm going to start out with uh, patient-centered care, what is it? So giving you a, a definition um, or a framework for what this would be in the current healthcare system. We will also talk about evidence for its use. In other words, what are the benefits of going with patient-centered care? And then we'll talk about the role of the stakeholders. Holders. Who are the participants in evidence um, in patient-centered care um, and what are they supposed to do? And so that's the more practical piece for all of you in the audience. And then finally, I'm going to leave some time at the end to make sure that people have the opportunity to ask any questions that they might have. I hope that after this brief webinar that um, all of you that have participated will be able to uh, define patient-centered care. Um, talk about how patient-centered hearing health care might benefit you as the individual. And then finally, you should be able to describe the roles that the provider, the patient, and the family members or significant others that would have in this process. I'm going to start first by talking about what is patient-centered care. And, and actually, if you read any of the literature or any time that you go into a healthcare setting these days, I think that you'll see lots of definitions of this. Um, I selected the one that comes from the Institute of Medicine, uh, which defines patient-centered care as providing care that is respectful and responsive to individual patient preferences needs and values, and ensuring that the patient values guide all of the clinical decision making. Um, for me, this is a real shift, I think, from the way that we used to do things um, in healthcare settings. So let's talk a little bit about that first. Um, and for here, I'm going to use an example with you guys. Let's take Bob. 
Um, and let's say that I see Bob in my audiology clinic, and Bob comes in, and Bob has a uh, sloping high frequency sensory neural hearing loss, something that you might typically associate with age. And so with Bob, um, Bob will come in and I know based on his audiogram that he's unable to hear certain high frequency sounds, for example. Um, I know because he can't hear some of these high frequency sounds that voices might seem muffled to him. Um, I also know that Bob probably turns up the volume on the TV. Um, and when he does so, he probably can hear it well himself, but other individuals with him um, probably are uncomfortable with that. Um, I also know, uh, based on this, that Bob will probably tell me that uh, listening one-on-one -on -one is okay. Um, in a quiet situation, Bob probably does pretty well, but once there's noise in the background, like at a family gathering or going out to a restaurant, Bob will have some real challenges. And Bob, these days, might avoid talking on the telephone. It's not the easiest thing to work with. And so given that audiogram, um, in a traditional medical model or a traditional approach, what I would say is, Bob, I've got the solution for you. And the solution for you is going to be this brand new set of hearing aids that you see over here. We've got lots of wonderful models um, that are available for you. They're the latest and greatest technology. Um, they will have special microphones in them so that you don't have to worry about listening in noise. They'll have a switch for the telephone, which will take care of that. Um, and overall, they're going to make things louder and probably easier for you to hear. Um, and these are great, and they look stylish now. And uh, based on that, Bob, I think I can do something for you. That's the very traditional approach to the management of hearing loss. But um, you see, in the traditional medical model, it's pretty much like this. Uh, I'm telling Bob, Bob, you need to get this hearing aid, and blah, 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 blah. At some point along the line, Bob may stop listening to me, but I sort of have my sort of standard approach to how I would manage this particular type of hearing loss. However, I'm going to pose the question to you guys as the group. So this is where we have a virtual raising of the hands, I guess. So in this traditional approach where Bob comes in and I see a hearing loss that I've seen before and I offer my hearing devices, the question really is, um, A, do you think that this approach is effective, it's always effective? B, no, the devices really don't solve the problem. Or C, maybe, but something's missing from this picture. Okay, and I guess the fun thing about this uh, webinar is I'm watching your votes as they come in. Okay. Um, and so far, it looks like right now I'm getting an overwhelming number of people who think, see, this is approach might work, but something is missing. Okay. If you were in my um, class right now, I think I would agree with you, and I would ask you why. What do you think is missing? Um, so in this case, though, I'm going to have to jump ahead, and I'm going to say that I agree with you. Um, and I do think something is missing. And what I think is missing from this approach, this traditional approach, is Bob. Um, you'll notice that as I described this, and, and many of you may have experienced this yourself, um, I talked about Bob as if he were the hearing loss. So I looked at his audiogram, and based on his audiogram, I made some decisions about the types of problems that he might have, um, sounds that he wouldn't be able to hear, um, and the difficulties that he would encounter. Okay? And I've seen a lot of those audiograms over the course of my career, and I might say, well, given my clinical expertise, these are the problems that I think Bob has, and this is the best approach to it. The problem is that I didn't really ask Bob what he thought about that. Uh, I didn't ask Bob what his problems are and what he hoped to accomplish with our healthcare interaction, and so Bob really wasn't part of that picture. Um, and in a patient-centered approach, is there's really a shift from it being something where um, the healthcare provider is the center of that interaction to the patient being the center of the interaction. Um, and I would argue that's really where, where it needs to be. So if we look at this from Bob's perspective, we get a slightly different picture. Okay, so now, taking a patient-centered approach, Bob would tell me that, yes, he has a hearing loss and he is 
interested in hearing loss management. Um, but it's not necessarily hearing particular sounds. Bob really wants to be able to communicate more effectively at home and at work. Um, Bob's family also has some thoughts about how we should manage his hearing loss okay, and the difficulties that he's encountering both at home and at interacting with his family members. That's a critical piece to the success because the communication problem that Bob has doesn't happen to just Bob. It happens to everybody else that he interacts with and that's a really a critical piece that's not captured well in that other model. Bob's employer might have some thoughts about needs and accommodations that he has at work. Uh, Bob may have a physician who oversees his general health, and that person might have something to say about this. And of course, we might have the hearing health care team that Bob is going to work with to address some of these needs. So if we contrast these two different approaches, um, you'll find that the traditional approach is very much centered on the provider. And the patient-centered approach is really centered on the patient. Um, so that, to me, is the most critical piece. If we do a sort of one-to-one -one comparison, this is what you see here. Um, on the, what is my left side of the screen, right, is what happens in the medical model. And you can contrast this, which is what is on the right side of the screen, which is the patient-centered model. In the medical model, which I just described to you, the patient actually takes a very passive role. Um, the patient's quiet. Um, the healthcare provider is providing information to the patient, and the patient sort of sits back and they are a recipient of the treatment. Um, in the traditional medical model, um, the patient is really not voicing many concerns, even if there is a problem, because they go to the expert and they presume that the expert is going to make the right decision for them and give them co the correct treatment plan. Um, the provider is usually the one who dominates the decision-making process. And so as I said in the example that I used, when Bob came to see me, I said, Bob, these are the hearing aids that you need. Um, and I made my recommendation. Um, and Bob may or may not agree with that recommendation, but that's really how that process works. The other thing that I find particularly, sorry, not easy to say, particularly concerning um, about the medical model is that it is very disease-centered. Um, somewhere along the line with that type of approach, I stop looking at Bob as if Bob is an individual, and I just look at the hearing loss. I just look at that audiogram and think that I know everything about Bob and how successful he's going to be based on his hearing thresholds. Um, and I know that many of you in the group have gone through the process of having your, your hearing evaluated. And yes, it is useful information. However, it doesn't tell me everything that I need to know in order to help Bob successfully manage that hearing loss. Um, an audiogram, um, as I often tell my students, it really only gives you a very gross approximation of what the person's listening experience is. Uh, we don't go through the world listening to isolated tones at very soft levels. Uh, we communicate in a very dynamic auditory world that has sounds that come from a variety of different pitches or frequencies at different intensities, and they're often mixed in with other sounds. And the audiogram simply doesn't capture that information well. And so a model that is very disease-centered or disease-centric really doesn't do justice um, to the challenges of living with hearing loss. Another thing that tends to happen in the medical model is that the provider uh, does most of the talking. Um, and in my own uh, research a couple of years ago, we did a kind of a fun study where we looked at the videotaped interactions between clinicians and their clients. And it was for a standard hearing aid evaluation and a hearing aid pickup. And what we did is we videotaped uh, what went on to try and figure out the best counseling styles that we might be able to use with patients to help them um, have more successful outcomes. And one of the striking things that we found is we analyzed this communication um, and we looked at the amount of time that people spent talking. And it turned out that probably about 80% of the time, the clinician was just talking um, at the patient. They really weren't interacting with the patient. And the patient was just sitting there very quietly and sometimes rolling their eyes, depending on what the clinician was saying. Uh, but it, to me, was the powerful message about the fact that the patient, in that instance, really was a, a collaborator in the process. The patient was just sitting back and letting um, the provider 
uh, dominate the discussion. Um, and so the end result of that, I think, is that the patient may comply with the results, um, but sometimes they don't. Okay. Um, and there's something to be said for that because we know that there's a lot of individuals out there who have hearing loss of varying degrees who might benefit from some sort of intervention, uh, but they don't follow through. They either don't come in for an evaluation or perhaps they come in for an evaluation but they decide not to do something about it. And I think we have to go back and look at the process because the process might be part of the problem. If we contrast that with the model that we have over here, which is patient-centered, patient-centered is, in, in the patient's role in this case is much more active. This is where the patient asks questions. Um, and I'm sure that personally, as I've shifted my focus from where, the way that I was trained, which was very medical model oriented, to patient-centered, I probably drive all my healthcare providers crazy because I ask an awful lot of questions. I am not going to make any decisions about anything until I've had all my questions answered, and I certainly encourage patients to do that. Um, in a patient-centered approach, the patient is the partner in the treatment. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the roles that the patient has and what they bring to the table, uh, but truly, the patient has an equal uh, role in this process. We each bring important but different things to the table. Um, the third uh, point about this is that the provider collaborates with the patient in making the decision. Um, you may have heard some things um, in the healthcare literature about something called shared decision making. Um, and in shared decision making, what happens is that the provider will give the patient information, options and choices that they have, um, and then they will work with the patient to help guide them in making a decision but the patient is the one who ultimately makes the decision about the treatment. Um, and that results in better outcomes because the patient is more likely to adhere to a treatment plan that they've decided is important and of value to them. Um, unlike the medical model, which is, as I said before, very disease-centered, um, the patient-centered model is all about quality of life. It focuses much more on what the patient is doing in their daily activities, what's important to them. Um, to be honest with you, it probably is not that important if you hear a pure tone, um, but it is very important if you can hear your grandchildren or that you can communicate at work or that you can pick up the phone and order a pizza if you live somewhere other than rural Connecticut, which is where I am and we don't have delivery. Um, but those types of things are important. It's all about quality of life and that's, that's what it's about. It's about creating a treatment plan that will work and improve the quality of a patient's life. Um, in the patient-centered model, as you can figure out already, the provider listens a lot more and talks a lot less. Um, most of the audiologists I know, myself included, we like to talk. We're very good at doing that. Um, but we also need to listen because that's important because there's no other way for us to know what the patient's needs are if we don't give them the opportunity to talk and share, share what they would like to accomplish in the plan. And then the end result is that hopefully the patient's going to adhere to the treatment plan because they had a role in the treatment plan. So these are the elements that are really important with the patient-centered care. Um, why do I think this is so important for us, for individuals that have hearing loss uh, right now? Um, I think it's very important because what is uh, most of the patients that I see um, have a hearing loss for which there is no cure. If I gave you that first example that I did before, and Bob came in to see me with those sort of similar complaints, and I looked in Bob's ears and he had a lot of wax in his ears, and then I took the wax out and Bob could hear again, Bob would leave my office a very happy person, he wouldn't be back. However, most of the patients that we see have sensory neural hearing loss. And so they have hearing loss for which there isn't a cure. So there's nothing at this point in time that I can do to make that hearing loss go away. But what I can do is work with Bob so that we can develop better um, management strategies for him. So for most individuals who have sensory neural hearing loss, this is a chronic health condition for them. And so it's a different experience than going in and having wax taken out of your ears this is, I've got a hearing loss, it's not going to get any better, it might get worse over time, and what the patients really need to do is they need to learn successful management. 
And in order for management to be successful, we have to incorporate the patient and their daily life into this process. Um, and the example that I often give people is um, think about it with diet and exercise. So if someone acquires diabetes, for example, because of poor diet or age or one of those factors, and they go to the physician, the physician might say, okay, I can give you a medication. But the medication is only going to do so much because in order to manage this diabetes, you have to go out and exercise, you have to change your diet. There's other things that you need to do because this is going to be an ongoing condition. Um, and in that case, the patient has to develop an exercise plan and change their diet in a way that's meaningful for them because otherwise they're not going to comply with that. And the same thing is true with hearing loss. If you want people to be able to successfully manage their hearing loss, you've got to look at what's important to them and, and to their lives. And so patient-centered care is so very important when we're looking at a management treatment versus a sort of one-time uh, we can fix the problem. So what are the keys to patient-centered care? Um, different, um, you'll see published in other areas, different types of main points, but these are the four items that I think are key really to patient-centered care. Um, and for me, it all starts with respect for your patient. So your providers have to respect and honor the patient, their family members, um, and their ability to make choices. And you need to be mindful of also the patient values and the patient's culture. Not everyone has the same perspective on how things should be treated. Um, and you need to provide patients the opportunity to choose and be respectful of their decision. It is their right to choose the treatment plan. That's the first and essential, most essential item, I think, in patient-centered care, is that your providers are really unbiased and open to this um, individuality in all of these patients. Uh, the second thing is information. That's what I see as the second key. Because in order for you as a patient to be able to make a decision, you have to have the right amount of information. Um, and they have to be presented to you in a manner that you can understand. Um, and I think my favorite example of this is if anybody's gone to a healthcare provider and you've looked at a HIPAA form, um, I don't know if anybody's ever read that HIPAA form. Um, I'm a little skeptical about that. But sometimes the language that's used it's not something that's readily understandable for your, your patients. Uh, I think that if someone is going to be expected to make a decision, you have to present information to them in a way that you, they understand. And I don't mean by that, I don't mean dumbing down the information, but I mean choosing your language wisely. Um, you know, staying away from a lot of the technical jargon, for example, that so often healthcare providers like to use, they can you know, use everyday language um, to explain things so that people can make a decision having an understanding of what it, that information is. Um, it's also important that information gets presented to the patients in a timely and accurate manner. Um, you want to get your results. Um, and I think in some respects, um, electronic access to healthcare care um, can help this because oftentimes now if you participate in a healthcare care program where you have electronic access to your test results, you can often see this quite quickly. Um, the third key here would be participation. And this is the participation of the family and the patients themselves, and however much they want to participate. There are some patients who perhaps um, only want to participate in a minimal way, and they are happy to defer to the healthcare provider. But there are other patients that would like to have a little bit more engagement, and you have to respect those decisions and encourage them to engage and participate. The fourth and final key that I see to this is collaboration. Patient-centered care is a team approach, and there are lots of team members that work together. The patient is being the center of this approach, the hearing health care provider, you might have a physician, you might have an um, insurance company involved in this, you might have hospitals, depending on the setting, but everybody's going to work together, and ultimately that's going to result in a better experience for the patient. Um, all of this, if we put all these keys together, um, this would hopefully result in a successful outcome. Um, in an ideal world, we'd get the optimal outcome by including the patient into the process. Um, but as we'll see, that doesn't necessarily always happen. Okay, so I have my second quiz item here for you guys. This is the instructor in me. We have to have a quiz to make sure that everybody's still with me. So, patient-centered care. 
do you think that this really works? Um, answer A, if you think, yes, I am confident that this works. Um, B, no, the healthcare provider is the expert. Um, I trust their recommendations. Or C, maybe I think this is a good idea, but what happens if I make the wrong choice? So what do we have in terms of our votes here? A, yes, I'm confident that this works. B, no, the healthcare provider is the expert. I trust their recommendations. Or C, maybe, but I'm a little bit concerned that I might make the wrong choice. Hmm. As I'm looking at my numbers here, I would say we're a little less confident. We're actually split right now. So half of you right now think that yes, you're confident that this works. Um, and half of you right now think maybe, but I'm not sure. I'm a little bit worried um, uh, if I'm making the right choice. And I see a question that pops out. Are we answering as a patient or as a provider? That's a good question. I hadn't thought about that. Nancy's saying patient, so let's go with that one. Um, I can say, and obviously I'm a little bit biased about this, I'm going to go with A. Yes, I'm very confident that this works. Um, and here's why. Okay. If we take a look at this, evidence would actually support what I'm, what I'm arguing. Um, but yes, if you use patient-centered care, evidence consistently shows that it results in better outcomes. Um, it has increased compliance, patients are generally happier and more satisfied. And I just gave you a couple examples of studies here, but there's quite, quite a few more that have addressed this. Um, the bottom line is that most of the evidence supports that if you use patient-centered care, the outcomes result in better quality of life for the patient. Um, and if you remember where we started this, my argument is that it really is about the patient and their quality of life. Um, but I do understand the concern because how is it that you know that you're making the right decision? Isn't that why you go to the expert in the first place? Um, so, you know, if I were to go to a cardiologist and the cardiologist would say I need surgery, I might say, well, the cardiologist knows a lot more about the heart than I do. Um, they went to schooling for this. Aren't they the expert? Um, and yes, they do bring their expertise, but you are also the expert in your life. So let's kind of take a look at the roles and responsibilities here. It, it really is about balance. I think that sometimes when we present these different approaches to the management of healthcare issues, we tend to present it as an all or none. And I did that myself, actually, when we started this talk. I said, well, there was the traditional or the medical model approach. You know, on this particular scale that you see here, it's called the biomedical approach. And that's the way that I was trained. I was trained that after X number of years of school, I should be able to uh, identify a hearing loss and tell a patient what hearing aid is best, and we would move forward with that. Okay? And then I just presented you a very different model over here that's patient-centered which says, okay, I'm going to give you my thoughts, but then you're going to make the choice as the patient. Um, and I think that really what it is is it's about balance. There are some times in certain issues where I think that using something that is more clinician-driven is probably more appropriate. You know, if I have an emergency, if I'm in a car accident and I go to the emergency room and a decision needs to be made about my medical care, I'm going to let that be a very physician or healthcare provider-directed interaction. So when we're talking about the management of a chronic condition, such as hearing loss, where the person is going to live with this hearing loss over the course of their lifetime, I think that we need to shift that balance a little bit, and our patients should get a lot more say in that process. Okay? And so this is, I would view this, I would argue that this is a continuum, and that in some instances you may tilt towards one versus the other, depending on the situation, and also it depends on the patient. Sometimes the patient might not be comfortable making that decision, and they would very much like to have an interaction that would be more healthcare provider driven. But in other instances, it's perfectly acceptable and probably appropriate if the patient is the one that directs that interaction. Um, and I think what you tend to find is that as we move away from something that can be medically treated to something that needs to be managed over time, such as hearing loss and other chronic health conditions, we begin to see that shift to something that is a little bit more patient-centered because the patient is the one that is living with this. Um, and that's really the critical point there. Okay, as we kind of get to our next topic, we're going to talk about uh, roles and responsibilities. 
Um, and I think that this helps, for me at least, to um, tease out that balance. Um, I think that we're both experts. I think that um, as a provider, you have expertise in certain areas, but I also think as a patient, you have expertise. Um, and so for the provider, you, uh, the provider is the expert in the clinical matters. That's true. Um, I don't expect that all of the patients that I see will have a degree in audiology or in hearing science or something like that. Um, and that's that was what I was trained to do, and I will certainly do that to the best of my ability, and I keep up on that, and that's my professional responsibility. So that's my area of expertise, and that's what I bring to the table. However, um, I can't discount my patient because my patient is the expert in their life. Um, I see you for maybe an hour at an appointment, okay, um, and that's my interaction, but there are so many other things that go on in your life on a daily basis that could very much affect the quality of the hearing health care that you receive, and that is your level of expertise. Um, for example, for a lot of uh, individuals who work with children, sometimes the scheduling uh, of an appointment is a huge deal. I look at my clinic schedule and I know where patients are slotted in and how my appointments are um, slotted throughout the day. But I don't know necessarily that you have two children and you need to pick up from school and you need to get back and get them, so my appointment needs to end by 3 o'clock. So you are the expert in your life and I'm the expert in the clinical matters. But the two of us both play a very important role in this process. Um, so as the healthcare provider, if we look at this, this is what the healthcare provider can do in patient-centered care. First and foremost, I think that the healthcare provider needs to look at their services through the eyes of the patient. Um, and I give you an example here that um, is where I take off my hat as a clinician and I put on my hat as a parent. Um, when my daughter was very young, she had a period of time where she was having multiple ear infections. And so my audiology hat, I looked at it and I said, okay, she's got a mild hearing loss. I know that there's fluid behind her eardrum. I know the impacts of this. Um, this is my child. So we went to an ear, nose, and throat specialist to take a look. Um, and the ear, nose, and throat specialist knew what I did for a living. And he said, okay, well, we can put the tubes in. And at that moment in time for me, I took off my clinician hat and I took, put on my parent hat. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute here. Um, I don't know that I want to put my three-year-old through surgery yet. It's only been three months. I know that this can resolve. And I'm a little scared of the anesthetic. And this is a three-year-old child. And for me, that was a really eye-opening experience because for the first time, I really thought about how often have I told a parent, tubes are no big deal. You need to get the tubes done because it'll drain the fluid, which is true. But I wasn't thinking about the fact that uh, this is a three-year-old child going under an anesthetic and how the parents might feel and what anxiety there might be. Uh, and for me, that just really hammered home the point that you need to look at the services and the recommendations through the patient's perspective. Um, and I think that we need to be mindful and have empathy for our patient. And, and I think a good health care provider will do that for you. They won't necessarily, again, see you as, as a disease or a condition. But in patient-centered care, they see you as an individual. Um, the health care provider also needs to value the patient's expertise. Um, and that's what I talked about before. I'm an expert in hearing aid, but I'm not an expert in your life and what you need to have managed. That's really what you bring to the table so that I know what we're trying to achieve. Um, I think it's incumbent upon health care providers to learn a lot about patient diversity, attitudes, values. Um, we live in a very diverse, diverse culture here in the United States, and not all cultures share the same values about treatment um, and medical management. And I think that it's very important to be cognizant of that, even down to the fact of who you communicate with when someone comes into your office. It's very, very important. And uh, patient-centered care will take that into consideration. Um, and of course, you need to provide service and care with great respect for human diversity through anyone that we see. So what then does, that's what the healthcare provider should do in patient-centered care. What does the, what are the roles of the patient? Okay, because now, remember, we're partners in this. 
Um, and so there are things that the patient needs to do. And so for many of you in, in the audience, I hope these are the things that you want to take home, that you think about the next time that you go um, for your healthcare evaluation. First and foremost, ask questions. Okay. You need to be comfortable asking any questions that you might have about a procedure, a recommendation, a test result, and, and ask your questions until you get them all answered. Um, that's very, very important in this process. Uh, it's also important to articulate your goals and your expectations. Um, as I said before, if I look at the audiogram, I can make some predictions, I think, about situations where people might have difficulty or challenges that they might have, but I don't really know what you hope to achieve. And for example, I might think it's really important for you to understand speech as best as possible, but maybe you're a musician and your primary goal is to understand music. Now that's a very different fitting and hearing aid fitting for certain. Um, so you need to be able to articulate what you hope. Um, what I, I'm always concerned about with patients are all those sort of unmet expectations where people haven't shared um, what they're hoping to achieve and then somehow we, we result in a, in a treatment plan that's not satisfactory but that's because I didn't actually know um, what the patient was hoping to achieve. Um, Third, you've got to educate yourself. Um, you've got to be a consumer of the information um, and you know, get comfortable with it because if you're going to make a decision, you need to educate yourself a little bit about all of the options that you have. Um, and I think that there's been some very nice decision aids developed both in um, hearing sciences and audiology and in healthcare in general that can help you to do that. Uh, you value your clinician for what they have to offer and that's your clinical expertise. Right? And then most important, I think, on this list is probably advocate for yourself or your family member if you are or part of the uh, family or you're a caregiver for someone. It's very important that you advocate for yourself in this process because you remember you're coming to the table as an equal, an equal with different expertise but nonetheless an equal and so you need to advocate for the things that you would like to see have done. Um, and I certainly know that HLAA is a great proponent of this um, in encouraging individuals with hearing loss to advocate for themselves and the needs that they have. Bringing this all together, what do we achieve? As I said, patient-centered care really is about being a team. Um, and I borrowed this photo, which I thought summed it up nicely, that team, if you look at it, means that together everyone is going to achieve more. And then I will end my sort of lecture piece of this with a quote uh, from Patch Adams that sort of summarizes this nicely that says, if you treat a disease, you win some, you lose some. But if you treat a person, I guarantee you win, and no matter what the outcome. All right, so I thank you for listening to my lecture piece, and I hope that you have some questions now um, about the topic of patient-centered um, care. I see some questions appear in the, um, the chat box. I have a question of my own, and that is, um, you said that you were trained more on the biomedical um, approach, and now you're for the patient-centered approach. What is being taught in AUD and PhD programs now? Um, are they more towards the, pa the patient-centered approach? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Yeah, I do think that there is a generational effect in terms of how um, we're training our students. Um, when I did my training, we won't tell you how many years ago, um, I did a lot of my training with the Veterans Administration, so I worked in medical centers, and we were we were trained that as a healthcare provider, you know, you were you were the expert. But in the last, in, in probably in the last five years or so, in particular, I would say that in audiology programs, I've begin, begun to see a shift. I think that. Um, at least with adults. I think with children, we've actually been much more patient-centered or family-centered for a longer period of time. We've seen a lot more of this collaborative collaboration and teamwork with children, but with adults, for some reason, we just thought they came in, we just give them a hearing aid. And I think that by and large, we found that that's not always successful. And I think because of that lack of success, we're really um, getting more proactive about engaging the patient. And we encourage our students to do that. As most AUD programs will now encourage this 
more collaborative type of approach. I don't know if it's reached out everywhere. Um, this is not a new idea for sure. This has been around for quite a while. It's just taken longer to get some traction. It takes a little bit of change on the part of the clinician as well as the patient. Okay, that's what I suspected. <laughs> um, Carrie Wathen would like to know, uh, she said, do you think some of the older doctors, such as the CI surgeons, are still using the older approach, and how do we get them to this new way of thinking? Oh, that's a good question, and I would suspect that you do have some older, um, I don't want to say older healthcare providers who I won't necessarily take on physicians. Um, I do think you have some people who were trained, just myself, a while ago and maybe longer, um, who are very schooled in the way that they work. Um, and so they might not necessarily want to change. Change is not easy for a lot of us. And that I'll be honest about that. It's hard for a lot of people in, in many different ways. I think that the best way that you can advocate for it is to be, as a patient, more proactive. Uh, you can ask as many questions as you want. I mean, and even in a traditional approach, the, the, the healthcare provider can't stop you from asking the questions. They might be a little bit more abrupt. But I think you just have to keep going at them with the questions and just say, hey, I want to make this decision wisely um, and see if you can encourage them to come around. Okay, I guess Vicki is uh, following up on that same uh, thread is, how do you get somebody who is trained in that old school to change their, um, their approach and become more patient-centered? Yeah, it's hard. I think as, as providers see the benefit in it, then I think that you will see some of these more of the older generation, so to speak, make that transition. I do know that a lot of the larger hospital centers are holistically, as a hospital, making that transition to patient-centered care. And I think that when it also when it comes from the top down, so to speak, that that will encourage some people to maybe make that shift who might be a little bit more reticent to do it. Uh, Priscilla asked, do you use any questionnaires to help patients think about what their treatment goals may be? By the way, I'm a hard of hearing doctor who practices in nursing homes where we are trying to do patient-centered care? Yeah, uh, excellent question. Um, I love, I love self-assessment questionnaires, and a lot of the work I have done has been with that because that is, that's really the way for those patients who can't necessarily articulate maybe the questions that they have or the goals that they like, if you give them some guidance, you might be able to tease some of that information out. Um, one of the things that our clinicians use regularly um, is something called the COSI, which stands for a client-oriented scale, um, but it's not something that is a name you need to worry about. But what it is is it's an open-ended questionnaire where we ask somebody simply, tell me what are the three things that you would like to improve with your hearing? And then that they can do. It's, it's not complicated, and they can say, oh, I would like to improve, you know, hearing my grandchildren. That's always a big one. Or maybe talking on the phone. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe I like to watch The Price is Right, and I would like to be able to hear it better. And that actually gives us a lot of information. And then we have something that we can work off of, we can have a dialogue with. So sometimes I think the simpler questionnaires um, can be easier in encouraging that type of dialogue with the patient, and it's a great place to start. Okay, Barry uh, says, uh, can you address how the economics of audiology impact patient-centered care? As more hearing aids are being sold by people who are not audi audiologists or audiologists are encouraged to reduce the cost of hearing aids and then charge for follow-ups, does that discourage patient-centered care? Um, I, I honestly think that fitting hearing devices is a continuum. I, I, I think that there's probably a place for all different types of devices. Um, and I also don't think that a device is always the solution. In some cases, I think maybe people don't need a hearing aid at a particular moment in time, and maybe something else would be a better approach. Um, but in any of those examples, I think that patient-centered care is needed. Because in order for me to best assess what 
might help you manage your hearing loss, we need to have an honest conversation between the patient and the clinician in order to, to set those goals. Um, the cost of hearing aids is probably um, sort of a, another issue which I know is going to become a, a very hot discussion in probably in the next couple of days because of what's going on right now with the FDA. I think it's time to have that discussion. I think that it's a reasonable question that people have. But regardless of the outcome of that, it still doesn't change for me the fact that anybody that I see, even if I don't see them for a hearing device, if I see them for a hearing evaluation, I should still be patient-centered through that whole process. Um, and ultimately, I think it's going to result in better outcomes for everybody, the audiologists and the patient, because if we get it right the first time, then everybody benefits from that. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, Jay said, could insurance companies be helped by patient-centered care to be more empathetic and lower the cost of hearing aids? Um, the insurance companies I haven't tackled yet, but I do think, um, I think that there is a movement right now to look at patient-centered outcomes. Um, insurance companies are looking at that where they want to know before they provide reimbursement for any service, and it's not just hearing devices, but anything, um, they want to make sure that there is, in fact, a benefit to the patient in their everyday life. And that's where that quality of life piece comes in. And again, I think that that supports patient-centered care because patient-centered care seems to result in better outcomes and quality of life. Um, you know, maybe, um, we don't get the most fabulous results when I test somebody in a sound booth, but that doesn't necessarily mean that when they walk out the door, if they have a specific need that I've met with a hearing device or some other treatment, we may have very good outcomes. And that's really what insurance companies are moving towards in terms of reimbursement. They're moving towards reimbursing outcomes and not necessarily specific procedures. Okay. Um, does patient-centered practice include being sensitive to patients' economic reality in, re yeah, in recommending an aid? It absolutely should because that's part of, again, the, the provider provides the clinical expertise in what's out there, but the patient provides the expertise in their life. And if you know, you're in a situation where financially you can't afford something, um, that, that has to be part of the, the, the process. And, and that's why I try to teach, certainly my students, that it, it's a continuum. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And the top-end model of something isn't necessarily always the best model for a lot of reasons. Um, sometimes there's things that people don't need. Um, and sometimes there are people who can't afford that. And, and my goal um, is to serve as many people with hearing loss that I can. Um, and I think that it's more important that we reach, a, we reach a broader continuum and not necessarily always focus on those high-end products. I, I think you do have to include the economic reality. That's a part of everybody's life. Sorry, um, Kathy, uh, one other question. Uh, it seems that audiologists are pressured to only recommend the highest end instruments. Is that changing? I, I think that that is. Um, I don't know that. Um, that every audiologist recommends the high, highest end. As I said, we, I tend to teach it as a continuum. Um, I think that it's important that we separate out providing the treatment uh, for the patient from the device. I think that that's critical uh, in, in that process. Um, it, I feel like if anybody is, is going to get a hearing device and they feel like they're just being sold a high-end device, and that's probably not the provider that you are interested in seeing. I, I think just as I would with my own health care providers, if I go to someone and it doesn't feel like the right fit, um, I would go to somebody else. 
Um, and I think that that's part of being patient-centered, is the patients are also seeking what they think are, is the best professional for them. Um, since we have a couple of minutes um, left, is, uh, can you speculate on what the FDA might be working on tomorrow um, for those that um, haven't kept up with that news? Um, maybe talk a couple minutes about what they're working on. Um, sure. Uh, this is, you know, this is a very interesting time right now, and I, I think that um, the debate right now is whether or not the FDA, FDA is going to open up their regulations regarding hearing devices and uh, introduce uh, a new class of devices that would be available over the counter. Um, I think that there's a lot of discussion, and I think that it's good. It's a good dialogue to have about the discussion. Um, I think we need to hear from all the parties. Um, one of the concerns is obviously the cost of hearing health care, um, and that certainly is uh, a critical piece. And as we've mentioned before, there are some people who you know, don't have the economics to be able to afford devices, and that's an important consideration. Uh, another consideration is the uh, availability. There are more people out there that have hearing loss that don't get hearing devices, um, and how can we reach that group? Um, but then there's also the concern about making sure that we provide the best care for individuals and, and making sure that simply putting on a device doesn't overlook perhaps um, a condition that should have med medical treatment. Um, we also want to make sure that when we give somebody a device that it's one that will, will really benefit them. And as I said, it's a continuum, but for some folks that have hearing loss, certainly just taking something over the counter is probably not going to meet their needs, and they do need sort of um, more specialized treatment. Uh, I think it will be very interesting to see how this all fleshes out, because I can see pros and cons in all different shifts of this, and I'm sort of following this debate very interestingly. Um, I think ultimately my hope is that we end up with a system that allows the most number of people the greatest access to hearing health care services. Um, and there's probably room in the marketplace for a variety of ways of achieving that. It will be very interesting to see what happens, um, for sure. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, uh, Charlie said she's encouraged. Uh, she was a counselor for many years and tried without success to encourage audiologists to offer a range of options and to provide patient-centered care. Um, she's happy to see a paradigm shift. I think we all are. <laughs> um, Let's see. I don't see any more questions, so I guess we'll call it a night. Again, Dr. Sudkowski, thank you very much for presenting, and um, I hope you'll consider presenting again. It's very oh, interesting. Thank you. And thank you so much, Nancy, for the invitation into HLAA. It was a great opportunity to do this. Okay. Thanks again. Okay. Thanks again. Good night, all. Good night, everybody.